webinar on China Maghreb relations organized by the Holling Center for International Dialogue. Uh, the Holling Center uh, is a nonprofit, non governmental organization dedicated to fostering dialogue between the US and countries with predominantly Muslim populations in the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Eurasia, and Europe. My name is Adel Abdel Ghaffar. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Doha Center, and it's a pleasure uh, to moderate this event for you. Over the past number of years, the role of China in the Middle East and indeed in the developing world has been subject that has attracted increasing interest. China's increased engagement comes at a time of uncertainty and a changing global order. These global changes and challenges have been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. China, China has reached out to the Middle East and has presented itself as part of the solution rather than the problem uh, and to reframe the narrative about its role in the crisis. All of this is happening at a time of deepening mistrust and competition with the United States and Europe. While much of the uh, research has focused on China's role with other parts of the Middle East, especially the Gulf, um, there has been much less focus on China's role in the Maghreb. And that's why we bring you today's uh, webinar. What are China's objectives in the Maghreb? How have Maghreb countries engaged with China? How is China perceived by the Maghreb public? Is China's growing role in the region overstated? And can, really, can China really replace the US and Europe? To answer these questions and more, we have assembled for you a uh, fantastic panel today. We have uh, Hassan Aouri, uh, professor at Mohammed V University in Morocco. He previously served as political counselor at the Moroccan embassy in Washington, DC, palace spokesperson, royal historian, and Wali of Magnus. He is the author of a number of key volumes and is currently writing a book about great power competition between the US and China. We also have Yahya Zubir, who is a senior professor of international studies and director of research in geopolitics at the Kedge Business School in France, and currently a dear colleague and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. He's the author of numerous academic works on China's relationship with the MENA region, particularly China's relationship with the Maghreb. Sarah Fewer is an associate fellow in the Washington Institute, an expert on politics and religion across North Africa. Sarah was previously a senior fellow and a SOREF fellow at the Institute, where she authored numerous policy papers and monographs covering developments across the Maghreb and religion state dynamics in the Arab world and generally. And last but not least, Tang Jiao Yang is a deputy director at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy and Vice Chair in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University. His research interests include political philosophy, China's engagement in Africa, and modernization process of developing countries. He is the author of China-Africa Economic Diplomacy and has published extensively on Asia-Africa relations. So please welcome our panelists. In terms of the organization of the webinar itself, we will focus on three key areas. Number one, China's relationship with the Maghreb governments. Number two, uh, perceptions of public perceptions of China in the Maghreb, especially in the post-corona uh, era. And finally, we want to discuss the repercussions of China's growing role in the Maghreb for the region's traditional partners, the US and Europe. Each panelist will have uh, four minutes or so to cover each topic before we move on to the next one. We also encourage our attendees to submit questions uh, via the Q&A function at Zoom. So after we spend an hour or so discussing the final half hour, we hope to engage our audience with uh, questions. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function. Okay, so in terms of order of speaking, to be uh, geographically diplomatic, we will start from the West, uh, from Morocco, then Algeria, uh, then Tunisia, and then uh, China. So, in terms of our first topic, uh, I want to discuss uh, what has China, what role has China played in terms of the foreign policy of the three respective countries. If we start with, uh, uh, with, with Morocco, Morocco is an interesting case in terms of its foreign policy has been really uh, directed towards uh, Europe, uh, but over the past couple of years, the, re the relationship with China has really uh, uh, blossomed. So I want you, Hassan, to perhaps uh, walk us through uh, Moroccan foreign policy 
uh, its main trajectories and how China fits in into uh, Moroccan foreign policy. Please go ahead. I'm very pleased to be here. And let me just, you know, say what you have said. I mean, Morocco has always, you know, a good relationship with Europe and the States. But it doesn't mean that China ha had been, you know, uh, absent. Moroccans like to, to brag themselves by the fact that, you know, Moroccan traveler called, called Ibn Battuta had been centuries ago in, 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 uh, in China. And they, they brag also by the fact that one of the Moroccan military leaders, Abdel Karim al Khattabi, had been quoted by Mao Zedong when he had talked with, with, uh, uh, with Palestinian uh, uh, militants. We have to admit that China had been present in, in politically speaking, you know, uh, background when it attended, you know, Bandung conference. Uh, and, you know, many uh, major events were very present in the psyche of the political leaders, the Grand March, uh, uh, the Cultural Revolution. So th this had been part of the, the, the Moroccan fabric. But indeed, we cannot speak of really close relationship till 2000, uh, when, when Mohammed VI took power. One of the visits that took place in, in May, you know, just less than one year than Mohammed VI took power, was by President Geniato, uh, uh, Ziming, I'm sorry, Ziming, uh, uh, in Tangier in 2000. And indeed, the Mohammed VI, you know, paid a visit to China in, two, in 2002. And it, it fit with a new policy to have different partners. Uh, Morocco had chosen the, to diversify it, its partners. Besides the, the Union of Europe, uh, Morocco was, was seeking to have relationship with Russia, China, I India, Latin America. And this is why, you know, a visit took place in, two, in 2000, and Morocco at that time presented itself as a link with, with Europe. In fact, we have to admit that Morocco is not as important in terms that he, he doesn't have natural resources, he doesn't have oil. It's uh, a promising market, but it doesn't have, you know, the natural resources like other African states like uh, uh, African or, you know, the Gulf, Gulf uh, uh, nations. Uh, and this is why in 2006, there was also an important visit by President Gianniato. I do think that the second turning point was uh, the Olympic Games that took place in China in 2008. Morocco, you know, had discovered a new face of, of China. It appeared that China was, was a player, was, was an appealing, you know, a, a partner. Uh, and this is why Morocco participated in 2015 in Johannesburg summit and took place publicly encouraging uh, uh, the Belt uh, uh, and Road Initiative, Initiative BRA, you know, Morocco, you know, uh, expressed its view by saying that it's an important and historical event. And at that time, Morocco was, ha had pleaded for kind of triangular uh, relationship, China, uh, Morocco, and, uh, and Europe. I do think that the third major event and turning point was when King uh, uh, Mohammed VI made his second visit to China in 2016. Uh, and uh, this, this visit was crowned with very important, you know, treaties. And uh, it was still what, what is called strategic association. Morocco was ranked to strategic association that China had w has with different uh, partners, which means that uh, Morocco would be engaged in political dialogue economic partnership and security cooperation. That's a that's very important uh, topic and, and human links. So to speak, now the Chinese companies are present, in particularly in Tangier, which is in, at the north of Morocco. And the Chinese uh, uh, companies serve as, as a hub and serving also as subcontractors to, to French uh, uh, companies. Uh, uh, there are many tools besides the legal tools uh, in terms of the banking system. Uh, Moroccan banks have opened both in, in Beijing and Shanghai, and by the same token, 
uh, the Chinese have their own places, both in, in, in Rabat and, and uh, Casablanca. I have to say, uh, the, the Chinese are, for, uh, are present in, in terms of infrastructure, communication, and solar energy. I do think that it's very important for Morocco. Uh, Morocco is stressing on the solar uh, uh, energy. Uh, I have to admit and finish by a few things that the culture aspect is also gaining. There are a lot of grants. Moroccan have started, you know, learning Chinese. Uh, there is Confucius centers. Uh, and by the same token, tourism is, is gaining. There are a lot of Chinese who are uh, visiting uh, uh, Morocco. I do think that, uh, and it is also, and I'll finish by that, there is also an important you know, project that Moroccans are looking towards China, which is the uh, uh, high-speed train between Marrakesh and Agadir. Uh, Moroccans are looking for the Chinese uh, uh, to conduct uh, that project. I do think that in terms of economically speaking, you know, the, the relationship are very promising between Morocco and, and China. Now, moving on to uh, Algeria. Of course, Algeria is, uh, is also an interesting case, but slightly different in Morocco that Algeria has uh, enjoyed uh, very good relations with uh, China uh, from, from early on. Of course, this relationship was framed in uh, uh, revolutionary romanticism of the uh, uh, post-colonial uh, struggle, but increasingly since the 70s and 80s has been uh, focused on, on economic uh, ties. So I, if, Hass if Yahya, if you can please elaborate a bit on, on the Algerian uh, side of things and how Algerian policymakers see China, uh, not only now, but uh, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Thank you very much for the Hollings Institute and um, Brookings uh, Center uh, for having me. Um, I, I would follow up a little bit on, uh, by the way, Adel, I'd like to remind you uh, that uh, during our talk uh, previously, I need to do a little bit on Libya and Mauritania. Of course, I'll ask, Just, I have a question on Libya and Mauritania for you in the next round. Yeah, it, it, it will be brief, but I will still uh, mention it. Um, you know, in the 1990s, um, you know, there were the, if you looked at the French uh, think tanks and what they were publishing, it was the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming. Uh, and then it's the Chinese are coming, and again, the Russians also are coming. But like Hassan said, you know, uh, the Chinese have been uh, around for a long time, and you can trace back the relationship with the Maghreb states to the Bandung Conference in 1955, where the three nationalist parties met with uh, Xuan Lai and the others who exposed to them, you know, the five principles of uh, foreign policy, of China's foreign policy, which were quite appealing uh, to those uh, leaders. Algeria is uh, particular, in, um, with no offense to the other Maghreb states, uh, Algerian-Chinese relations are extremely uh, close uh, for specific reasons, especially for the older generation, because uh, China was the first non-Arab country to have recognized Algeria, the uh, provisional government of Algeria in 1958, in December 1958, before China had diplomatic relations with France six years later. So it tells you how important the relationship is. And, and so, um, and by the way, since we will talk later about coronavirus, you know that the first medical team uh, that left, uh, that went overseas uh, and to establish itself overseas was to Algeria in 1963, following Shuan Lai's, you know, visit uh, during that period to the various uh, um, African uh, countries and North African countries in particular. If you look at the recent, uh, so the relationship has never ended except for, I mean, that was slowed down except during, let's say, when China was looking inwards uh, when Deng Xiaoping came to power, it, in fact, he's one of the, uh, it, the very um, the only one who didn't come to Algeria. Uh, but China was looking inward, but that didn't last very long because by the 1980s, the relationship with Algeria was growing. And by the way, Algeria is not uh, a, a force for China, at least, is not a major energy producer. It's not a major supplier of energy. So the interest is not because uh, of uh, energy. 
first, there's the geopolitical position of Algeria, its proximity to the Mid I mean, it's a Mediterranean country, its proximity to Europe, uh, and so on and so forth, its good relations with Africa and all that. These are very important. Um, and there is a common colonial history. So, so you see these bonds being uh, uh, reiterated here and there when they speak, you know, when the, the, the governments uh, talk to uh, one another. Uh, Algeria had taken a very important positions, for instance, uh, in 1971, Algeria was behind uh, China getting its seat at the United Nations Security Council in 1971. In 1989, with the, uh, after the Tiananmen Square uh, events, it was Algeria that was pushing the African countries within the Organization of African Unity, you know, to support China uh, and to encourage, you know, trade and so on with China. So that's for the uh, political component. In, in terms, if you look at the figures, the economic figures, in the 1980s, there was nothing much to talk about in terms of, you know, there was like 180 million, uh, the trade uh, volume was about 100 and, and less than 200 million anyway. Um, so by now, if you uh, look at the, the volume, it is in the close to 10 billion dollars. Uh, in 2019, it was close to nine billion dollars. It's very important. If you look at all the infrastructural works and, and, and so on, uh, very, I mean, big uh, landscapes and or, or, you know, just like the mosque, Algeria's mosque is the, the third largest now in, in, uh, in the Muslim world and it was built by, uh, by, by China and so on and so forth. By 2003, by the way, Algeria had become China's, uh, I mean, China had become Algeria's main trading partner, supplanting France, its traditional uh, trade partner. And this has been the case since 2003. It has remained uh, until uh, today. So um, Algeria joined, just like Morocco and, 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 and Tunisia, they, Algeria joined the Belt and Road Initiative. It joined the, uh, the um, Asian uh, Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Um, and so on and so forth. So the relationship is, is, is quite important and it's not limited to just economics. It's also uh, very good in terms of a very, uh, you know, in terms of uh, military, um, you know, uh, military purchases. And that they're not uh, cheap military purchases because with the revenues that Algeria had in the 2000s, Algeria could afford to buy some more sophisticated. And one has to always point out that Algeria has always made it a point to be a very, uh, you know, non-aligned, uh, no matter the relationship uh, with, with, with Russia, for instance, or ex-Soviet Union, it was in the military realm. You know, Algeria purchased 90% of its uh, military hardware uh, from uh, the Soviet Union slash Russia. Today, it's only 66%. And guess who is the second now? It is China. China has been the second uh, supplier of weapons to Algeria, and the third is Germany. So it, it, it gives you a sense of this um, Algeria's foreign policy, because we have a tendency of always looking at what the others do or want in the Maghreb. But we have to look at the interests. Like Hassan was talking, uh, when, when, uh, when Mohammed VI uh, went to China in 2016, and before he went to China, he had made the statement, we need to diversify. We don't give up our close relations with our traditional partners, but at the same time, you know, we are open to others. And I would argue that it, it's in the Maghreb in general. Since the Arab Spring, there was a sort of rapprochement uh, uh, with China. So um, China has become very important um, in terms of people to people. Uh, it's also growing uh, in importance. There are a lot of uh, uh, Algerian students in China, with both with uh, Algeria's, um, uh, Algerian scholarships or with Chinese uh, scholarships. And the, the, in terms of the Silk Road, for instance, Algeria is also becoming very important in the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, it has a, the project uh, was signed uh, in 2016 for a major port. Uh, and the port is like what China is doing elsewhere. That is, it's not just a port, but there's also uh, uh, an industrial park uh, adjacent to it. And, you know, and it's, it's part of this infrastructural work. 
Algeria is also special in the sense that it has one of the largest, if not the largest, Chinese communities uh, in Algeria. And people tend to forget that, I mean, or tend to fo fo focus on the Chinese workers. There are Chinese who have settled in Algeria. There have been studies about the Chinese who had come and stayed in Algeria. And what people uh, are also not aware of, there are intermarriages, intercultural marriages, Chinese marrying Algerians and so on and so forth. So, so it, it, it's quite an interesting uh, relationship. And so in the commercial run, it's going to continue. It has not reached the level in terms of like the tourism has not reached the level of what Morocco and Tunisia, although it's not very big in Morocco and Tunisia, Morocco was aiming at 200,000. It hasn't reached that level yet, uh, but it is there. Uh, I want to now move on to uh, uh, Tunisia. Uh, and again, another interesting case, but arguably China has uh, uh, the lightest uh, footprint there, but has been uh, on, a, on a bit of a charm offensive. There are uh, Confucian centers uh, opening, uh, potential uh, deals uh, happening with the Tunisian government. So I want, uh, perhaps Sarah, if you can reflect on, on how uh, China is positioning itself uh, currently uh, in Tunisia, and will it be able to actually compete with, with, uh, with Europe, which has a very large footprint in, in Tunisia? Yes. Um, thanks for thanks for having me and for organizing this uh, session. Um, so I think I would start by saying you know, a few things about what what Tunisia uh, sees in the potential for a relationship, uh, a more robust relationship with China. I think, as you rightly noted, Adel, the, the the footprint here is is admittedly pretty light. Um, and so depending on whether you look at this from the perspective of a snapshot uh, or whether you're looking at it from the standpoint of the trends, you might come away with a slightly different, um, slightly different point of view. I think for Tunisia, China simply offers um, a chance to uh, diversify mostly its economic ties. Um, certainly since the uprising 2011, getting Tunisia's economy back on track has been a, a key, if not the top priority. And so um, I think from Tunisia's standpoint, to the, to the extent that it can invite and attract investment uh, from China, that's, that's just a win-win. I, I suspect we'll hear later from Dr. Tang, who will, who will know this better than me, but how China looks at Tunisia. My sense is that Tunisia, uh, is attractive to the Chinese, not so much for the economic potential, um, but because of its strategic location. And we can maybe talk about this business of ports and where, um, where Tunisia falls into the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, if at all. To me, that's still a kind of question mark. So where are, where are the bilateral uh, ties? Um, wh where do we see engagement at this point? Um, I think there have been a flurry of uh, announcements, a flurry of agreements signed, um, and some that have started to be implemented, but I think we're still at the, at the very, relatively at the very beginning of this. So in the area of trade, for example, I mean, Tunisia isn't really exporting much to, to China, but in the last few years, um, China has become uh, it, it, it's in the top five um, sources of imports for Tunisia. Though if you look at the gap between, um, you know, there's France, Germany, uh, I think Italy, uh, and then China. And, and the gap between the, the, the top three and China is still pretty large. But nonetheless, it may be noteworthy that China has made it into the top, the top five at this point. Um, in terms of the... the um, energy arena. Um, we've seen agreements signed for Chinese investment in uh, solar energy development in Tunisia. But the bulk of the the bulk of the agreements and the bilateral engagement, I think, has focused on infrastructure um, development. And so here, for example, in 2018, there was an agreement that uh, called for China to help develop the Zarsis port in the south. Um, there are plans to build uh, 
uh, a railroad that would link uh, Gabes um, to, to Zarsis actually. And, and the idea being to try and make it easier to um, link up areas in the interior of Tunisia that are either rich in minerals or phosphates and get them, um, get them to the coast and export it uh, more easily. Um, China's also been involved in uh, building a hydraulic dam uh, in the Kef region and another region. And there are reportedly plans for uh, a Chinese um, state-owned car company to establish a production plant in Tunisia, and then it would sell cars not just in Tunisia, but, but also throughout Africa. And this is maybe one broader point that um, is worth mentioning. I think to some extent, China's already I think quite present throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, but I think there are some indications that it considers Tunisia as a potential kind of um, launching point for uh, for greater engagement in um, in the rest of Africa. And so, to the extent that Tunisia has developed ties um, either through its tech industry, for example, or, or others to, uh, to 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 companies um, and potential clients in Africa. It's, it's, it's perhaps attractive um, to the Chinese for that as well. Um, the final area that I would just note here in this initial kind of overview of the, the bilateral um, relations is actually in the security uh, realm. And um, here too, I mean, the numbers are really dwarfed by, um, uh, for example, even American security assistance, certainly French um, and, and European assistance more generally, uh, since the since the uprising in 2011, but nonetheless, again, if we're looking at this from the standpoint of a trend, it 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 is. I think it is noteworthy. So in 2013, um, Tunisia received uh, a grant from China, um, reported the, reportedly in the amount of eight million dollars, so that Tunisia could purchase Chinese equipment for its army, um, and it seems to have been mostly targeting counterterrorism um, operations. There was another grant cited in 2015 along similar lines. Um, and just last year, both countries announced their intention to have China assist in, in training uh, Tunisia's military. Um, but again, I would just, I would just uh, say that you know, relative to Tunisia's traditional partners, um, France, even now the United States, over the last 10, 11 years, these numbers are still um, are still pretty low. Um, so, if today there are around 11, I, I could I could only find a record of about 11 Chinese companies that are actively um, based in Tunisia. You know, the number of just French companies alone is around 1,400. Um, so, the, the 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 scale is is quite um, is quite different. And if anybody had a chance to um, see the press conference, um, uh, the Tunisian president is, is uh, just finishing up a visit um, in Paris. And you know, right at the outset of this press conference, I think it was today or yesterday, I don't know, I watched it, I was watching it on YouTube earlier, but um, President Macron announced in passing that um, you know, France would be giving a loan of 350 million euros. Um, uh, to Tunisia. And so just to get, it, it just is sort of a reminder, I mean, it gives you a sense of, um, of the scale of, of assistance. Interestingly enough, in that press conference, um, they both discussed uh, plans to have France, um, French assistance basically targeting a very similar infrastructure development project that uh, was outlined in the in the agreement with China um, in 2018, and so there is reportedly a plan to have the French help build a, a kind of TGV uh, high-speed rail line across the the eastern coast. Um, again, with, with in mind um, to to try and facilitate um, to try and facilitate extraction of, of of certain raw materials and get them to the coasts sooner. So everybody seems to be kind of in the same. Um, in, in the same game, uh, so to speak. I think we, we really had from our first uh, three speakers uh, an excellent overview on how each country perceives the, uh, the relationship. Uh, for now, I'd like to uh, head to speak with, uh, with Tang. Having heard that reflection, Tang, I'm curious to see uh, from a Chinese perspective, uh, how do Chinese policymakers 
uh, view the Maghreb and how does it fit in with it within the broader uh, relationship with the Middle East. Of course, when it comes to the BRI, there's a big focus on, uh, on the Gulf uh, and, uh, and ports, as well as in, uh, in the Suez, in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, but also in, in Morocco. So uh, we'd like to hear more on how, uh, how the Maghreb fits in in Chinese uh, foreign policy and policy making. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, for this uh, interesting uh, event. And uh, yeah, I think that as uh, Ada, you rightly pointed out, this uh, uh, MENA region actually has a very special uh, position in China's relationship with uh, in the war with different countries. Because first, the MENA region, they are part of this uh, FOCAC, so Forum of China and Africa Cooperation. This uh, mechanism between China and the continent, they have uh, been working since 2000. And uh, it has uh, been functioning quite well every three years. There are ministry level uh, meetings, but there are also uh, several Summits. So this uh, actually bring uh, the China's relationship with all the African countries, including the North African countries, uh, as a whole. Yeah, it's uh, not no longer just a, a very big uh, country with a small, uh, like Tunisia, that's uh, quite small uh, country, right? But uh, then actually as a part of the continent uh, delegation, then all these countries, they may have uh, the, uh, express their demand uh, through this group uh, presentation and uh, through a very extensive uh, discussion and uh, coordination. And uh, but uh, however, the North Africa they are also different uh, from the Sub-Saharan Africa, so that may, it belongs to this uh, Middle East, uh, the uh, in general the Arab world. So that also brings another uh, perspective, because the Middle East and the Arab world, they are relatively better off than uh, economically, uh, in terms of economy, economy yeah, than the sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So that the North Africa, actually, we do not hear a lot about this uh, argument on neocolonialism, on how China is uh, uh, also like on debt uh, trap policy, all this uh, current uh, controversies or some uh, like we see the uh, rumors uh, surrounding the sub-Saharan Africa. They are not so uh, active in the China's relationship with North Africa. So that brings, uh, uh, I would say it's rather an advantage because uh, the, uh, as the uh, four uh, previous speakers already mentioned, the relatively close uh, uh, economic development level between North Africa and China doesn't need to uh, think too much about uh, uh, the uh, like a do, uh, this donation or the aid, but I want rather to do the business. And uh, although the and uh, then the North Africa, I, like in Morocco, there are Chinese uh, tech companies uh, want to build uh, some bigger tech cities. In Algeria, there are large construction projects. And uh, previously in Libya, of course, that's a very major oil supplier and also a major market for Chinese construction companies, including Egypt. Uh, then there are also a lot of uh, business ongoing. Uh, rather than aid. And I think uh, in comparison to the West Asia, then the North Africa also, they are in a better position because even in spite of the uh, Arab Spring, some turbulence in North Africa, but uh, uh, the security situation is uh, relatively better than in West Asia, like Syria and Iraq, which are still uh, 
in the conflicts. And uh, also then uh, the geopolitical situation is uh, simpler in comparison to some GCC countries. So that uh, people may not see a lot of headlines about uh, China's uh, relationship with Algeria or with Morocco in the international media, but uh, there are more concrete uh, and uh, uh, mutual beneficial business uh, cooperation ongoing. And uh, that's my observation of the relationship. Yes, thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, Tang. Uh, now, having uh, reflected on uh, at a, at a bilateral level, uh, the next round of uh, the next question I want to ask you is more on uh, which uh, Yahya alluded to in terms of the people-to-people -people relationship. Of course, uh, North African countries, uh, due to the proximity uh, with Europe, uh, you have uh, family, friends, lots of uh, connections. Uh, so Europe and US are uh, specific. Europe is much more familiar. When it comes to China, there's an element of, of, the, of the unknown. Uh, so I wanted, uh, starting with you, Hassan, to just ask you, how is China uh, perceived by the people of, uh, of Morocco? Uh, and especially since the uh, eruption of, uh, of the pandemic uh, issue uh, and China's outreach to, uh, to regional governments and local uh, populations, has this outreach uh, worked? What, what are some of the areas uh, there uh, of the perception of the people of, of, of Morocco? Well, as I have said, the perception of, of Moroccans have dramatically changed due to uh, the Olympic Games that took place in 2008. I think that's very important how Moroccans, you know, uh, discover China, so if, if I can may. Uh, but things have dramatically changed due to uh, COVID-19 pan pandemic. Uh, I would say that the perception was was very positive, though at certain time there was some critical media, but most of the time uh, uh, the Moroccan perception was positive in the way the Chinese had dealt with the problem, and also by also about you know, the mask diplomacy. Uh, the names there was the talk between Minister of Affairs and his his counterpart. Uh, provided their aid. The position is, is very positive. And I do think that uh, the Chinese have invested in, in the soft, soft power. Uh, uh, they have been present before the, the pandemic. Uh, I've mentioned the Confucius centers, their presence, even with li libraries. Uh, nowadays in Rabat, for example, there's a library that says Chinese book, an English book, which you, you don't find. And it's once again, you know, a way how the Chinese are trying to penetrate the Moroccan society and, and the Moroccan, uh, the Moroccan uh, market. So, so, you know, to, to sum up, the perception of Moroccans as such is, is very positive. Uh, and particularly when, with comparison with the United States, though there are certain, there's a way where Moroccans could be critical I, I, when it comes to human rights and the, the Muslim minorities. Some media are, are, are very critical also, we have to mention that. Uh, particularly the ones, the Islamists, they are very critical towards China. Okay, moving to uh, uh, Yahya, also asking about the perceptions of, uh, of Chinese in Algeria. It's interesting, you also mentioned that the Chinese are helping build uh, the, the large mosque in Algiers. But I think during the, the protests, uh, that were happening in, in Algeria. Uh, there was comments on why why does Algeria need this huge mosque? The, the money could have been better spent in uh, in, in development. Uh, and of course, sometimes the contracting uh, with Chinese companies can be less can it can be a bit more uh, uh, opaque. But I, I just want you to reflect on on the, the people's perception of uh, of the Chinese in Algeria uh, previously and in the over over the coming. Uh, uh, years. If you look, uh, if you look back, uh, you're talking about the people themselves. Well, by the way, in terms of Algeria, does not have a um, uh, a Confucius center, but it has uh, classrooms uh, in the universities of Algiers uh, and Annaba. Uh, so 
the reason why they don't have Confucius is because of some groups, some radical groups who think that Confucius uh, is a religious figure when in fact uh, he is not. But that's besides the point. Uh, in terms of uh, people to people, there were there are different communities of Chinese, and some of them have succeeded in integrating within Algerian society. You see them; they would speak the common the the dialect. They, they talk to you if you go to some markets in Algeria. They 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 were they, they speak the dialect. Some of them are are married to to locals and so on and so forth. Another dimension that very few people know about, and one of our colleagues in Algerian. Frank, French Algerian, uh, who's an expert, Said Belgidoum, has written extensively on the informal sector uh, of this, uh, this, this whole Algerian, uh, uh, you know, the, the Algerians who are going, these are people who are outside the formal circuits, economic circuits, who go to China, work with, uh, uh, you know, they go to Yiwu and so on, and they work with, uh, with factories and so on, and they bring back uh, some uh, clothing and so on and so forth. So the the, the whole uh, the the whole perspective or the whole I mean the perceptions that the, the popular perceptions regarding the Chinese have changed tremendously. Uh, you have also a fascination. Uh, you know, in the old days, if you asked me 20 years ago the same question, I would say Algerians identify uh, China with cheap products. It's no longer the case. Uh, there is uh, more of an admiration. Uh, for China's success, for China's, you know, becoming a big power. Um, yes, there might be some regarding the Uyghur. There was some question one time uh, in 2009, uh, some rumors that the uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb was going to take revenge on the, on the Chinese who were in Algeria and so on and so forth. But that was, you know, uh, in, in some uh, reports, uh, newspaper reports in, in France, but nothing in, in Algeria of that nature. So overall, I would say, and if it's not just Algeria, look at Tunisia and, and elsewhere in Africa, the, the, the image is uh, uh, overall is more positive uh, because of the, uh, um, you know, the easy access to uh, Chinese products, to, uh, you know, you see everywhere. You go to, if you if I take Algeria, since that's my topic, you know, you go everywhere and you have signs, Chinese signs everywhere, the construction, they are everywhere. Yes, there were some, uh, there, there was one uh, skirmish in, in 2009 also uh, in, in Baba Zawar where, you know, some, some Chinese guy parked in the wrong place or something and there was, you know, there was a little battle and so on and it ended, you know, uh, peacefully eventually uh, so so overall to to sum up uh, the the the, um, the the perception of the Chinese is very good China is doing some um, some um, uh, software I mean software <laughs> soft power you know um, in, in, through the media you can find the China daily uh, in some places in Algeria uh, you know the, the television also there are some programs uh, you know, it, it, it's it's taking on a different uh, uh, dimension. And again, the press talks about it, and it talks about this old relationship that dates uh, to the time of the Algerian War, when it was the Chinese, they were the first to provide, uh, you know, uh, medical equipment uh, to Algerians. And this has increased uh, in this period of the COVID-19, because first, Algeria is the one that helped that sent uh, medical supplies to China. And then China reciprocated by sending, you know, not only medical supplies, but also medical teams. Uh, the last team stayed uh, for a month. There's a huge, uh, you know, the, the health, uh, public health uh, policy of China in Algeria is tremendous. You can find Chinese doctors in very remote places. They do acupuncture or just medical doctors who deliver babies and so on and so forth. They have been hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Algerian babies that were delivered by Chinese doctors. Thank you, uh, thank you, Yahya. Moving to uh, uh, Sarah, I was wondering if you wanted to reflect as well on, on the perceptions of, of the Chinese uh, in, in Tunisia. So uh, just to actually pick up where Yahya left off on the, the business of doctors, um, Tunisia also has had a program uh, since the 1970s, I think, um, 
of, uh, of Chinese doctors coming and spending time uh, mostly in the interior regions of the country where the, the medical needs are most uh, acute because the, the medical system hasn't, hasn't been as well developed there. Um, and so even before COVID, you, you did have some Chinese engagement um, in the medical arena. The, the Chinese were also involved in funding the construction of a, of a hospital in, um, in SPAX, which, uh, and, and there was some you know, press coverage of that. Um, regarding COVID, the, the Chinese donated some medical equipment, um, and then there was a, an agreement that um, it was a partnership ac actually between a, a, a Chinese drone company and, uh, and a Tunisian uh, tech firm to bring Chinese drones um, that were, you know, equipped with these uh, sensors, the temperature sensors, um, and, uh, and also um, like loudspeakers, so, so they could monitor when Tunisia was on, in its lockdown. S some of these drones evidently were used to, to um, you know, monitor some of these neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think in terms of, I, I, I don't, to be frank, I don't, at this stage, I don't, I don't feel fully equipped to speak about the sort of perceptions of the average Tunisian of what they're what they're thinking about China. I think, frankly, um, if anything, the main there are two liabilities for China in Tunisia. The first is just visibility. I think a lot of I'll venture to say that a lot of Tunisians are, are maybe just it, this isn't something they think about a lot. Um, it, it's not they're not really aware of what. China is is doing um, or not doing in the country. Tourism, which would normally be a way for some people-to-people -people engagement and, and, and getting to know one another, um, it, it did, we did see an increase um, from 2018 to 2019. Of course, now everything is, is, uh, is shut down, but, um, but still, you know, the numbers of, of Chinese tourists coming to Tunisia is a very small proportion of, uh, I think there were around 5 million visitors in 2019 um, to Tunisia. Now, they, they, did, they did lift some of the, uh, or they're in the process of lifting the visa restrictions from China, so that could eventually, once you know, the skies open up again, um, it, it could free up, uh, you, you might see an increase in the numbers, but you still don't have, for example, you know, direct flights or anything like that between the, between the countries. Um, I think in the educational arena, there have been some interesting developments. So um, they did open the first Confucius Institute in, I think, late 2018. Um, and so they're, you know, they're teaching Mandarin. Um, most, there are, there are around 450 Tunisians studying in China. This is compared to around 700 who are studying in the U.S. And far larger numbers who are studying in, um, in, uh, in France and, and Germany. Um, and still within Tunisia, there are more Tunisians, I think, studying Korean um, than, than, than Mandarin. Though I'm told that there is some interest now, and we've seen it in some universities in Tunisia, openings of um, Chinese studies. There are students who are interested in, in, in studying um, contemporary Chinese uh, society and, and culture. Um, uh, the last thing I would say before I turn to the, the second liability, I said there were two liabilities for the Chinese in, in Tunisia. One is the question of visibility, but I'll get to the second one in a moment. I think the, the business community in Tunisia, um, by all accounts, uh, views China positively, because again, here I think there's a, a desire for greater Chinese investment. I think from the standpoint of Tunisian businessmen and women, the, 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 the selling point for them is that, you know, they, they tell the Chinese, well, we can, we can serve as an entry point for you to Europe because, all of, because of all of our business connections um, with Europe. And so I think they generally view partnerships with Chinese um, firms as, as um, quite positively and not, not in terms of, um, not really in terms of competition in that sense. I think they, they're very open to that and, and, would, and would welcome it. Um, but the, but the, here's the, the liability, the second liability, I think, from the, the standpoint of the public. And that has to do with the question of democracy. Um, because I think 
Uh, certainly in the last 10 years since Tunisia started its own um, democratic transition, um, it's still, I know it's kind of hokey to say, and Tunisians themselves understandably get tired of hearing this maybe, but um, you know, Tunisia still, still relative to other countries in the region is, is, is doing on the political front anyway, relatively well. And I think there is still a, um, a, a, a deep and, and broad commitment, um, certainly among Tuni young, younger Tunisians today, um, to see democracy uh, really work for them. And so when they see protests in Hong Kong, for example, this is a big problem um, in terms of, the, of, of China's image. Um, and I think there have been indications that, the, that China's very aware of this um, and efforts to kind of preempt some of the potentially negative press and the negative image that, that, um, that can come out in Tunisia. But um, perhaps in, in contrast to some of the other countries that we've been discussing, though I would be curious to hear from the, the my co-panelists what, you know, I mean, the Hirak in Algeria, I'd be curious, what, what do they think about, you know, the Chinese system of government? Um, so in Tunisia anyway, I would say that it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an Achilles heel. So I'm actually going to jump to the final question in, in the session uh, and uh, the, uh, the role of Europe uh, uh, and the U.S. and the perceptions uh, regionally on what, uh, how, how to view China. So I'll actually uh, twist it around and, and start with Tang. Uh, Tang, uh, yeah, Tang. Tang, people are viewing uh, the, the, the rise, as, as Sarah mentioned, uh, uh, China, there's some positive perceptions, but also China is also, could be perceived uh, as a, uh, an authoritarian uh, 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 state in a time where the, the region's publics, arguably 10 years of the Arab Spring, are looking towards uh, uh, issues of democratization and, and so on. So I just want you to, to reflect on how China presents itself uh, and how Europe and the US should perceive the rise of China uh, uh, in, in, in the Maghreb. I think the question is really about uh, great power competition. Do you see win-win uh, modalities of uh, engagement or uh, is the Maghreb and North Africa going to be a potential area of, uh, of uh, discord between China and, uh, and Europe and the US on the other hand? In, actually, in MENA region, I don't think uh, China is uh, uh, competing with uh, uh, Europe very fiercely because uh, as uh, uh, Sarah or Yahya Hassan, they, you all mentioned, uh, the China's influence in MENA region is much uh, uh, less than Europe because this is uh, the traditional like, uh, way with the thousands of years history cooperation with Europe. And uh, China doesn't uh, really uh, want to compete there because uh, China actually uh, just uh, want to do business, want to find uh, some opportunities. And uh, uh, it's in some other regions, like uh, rather in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, we can see uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, remarkable China's presence because China's uh, uh, development uh, uh, cooperation manners work more effectively there. This is again related to what I said before because in the MENA region, then, uh, there are less problem on conditionality and uh, less uh, aid dependence. Not unlike in the Sub-Saharan Africa, there are so much, uh, like the US or Europe, they are so, have such a patronizing attitude towards the Sub-Saharan Africa. But to the North Africa, I think uh, the Europeans and also the Americans, they rather treat them uh, with more respect and uh, a more equal attitude. And so everybody, they are rather in uh, the state arena and uh, of course there are different uh, views uh, on government types 
And uh, like you said, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, even after the Arab Spring, Algeria or some other countries, they still have uh, their uh, own uh, government uh, types, which may not uh, really meet the Euro, Euro uh, we meet the Western standards. But uh, this is just also shows in this region, there are this uh, diversity of uh, uh, cultural and the political types. And I think China is uh, showing understanding towards uh, the religious, uh, religion, traditional religion, and also society in this region. As well in the Middle East, China also pays the respect to the different uh, government types and the society for social forms. And China also wants the similar respect to the Chinese government and the Chinese uh, society forms. So China just has this uh, uh, I think this position is clear. So this non-interference, it rather means, uh, and also mutual uh, respect, rather means uh, to respect each, uh, every country uh, have a different uh, uh, value standards and uh, cultural form, uh, uh, cultural and uh, uh, the society uh, forms. And this is actually already embedded in China's uh, tra traditional relationship with uh, countries like Algeria, with Egypt during their uh, independence uh, liberation movement. And just quickly before we jump, I have lots of audience questions here. I've received all of your questions, I'll ask them, but quickly to, uh, to, to Yahya and Hassan and, and, and Sarah, how should Europe and the US uh, react to Chinese uh, overtures and movements in, in the Maghreb. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about the states, um, the Algerians don't like to be told who they can do business with or who they can like or, or don't like. Um, so uh, I think the, the several times the, the French have expressed, you know, concern uh, about China's uh, increased presence in Algeria. And the Algerians responded basically, uh, well, uh, they are competitive, they have good prices, um, and we do business with whomever we want. Uh, but at the same time, don't forget, uh, you know, the, uh, in terms of what the Western powers, if you wish, um, the United States economically in the, in the Maghreb is not very important hasn't done uh, much except for the oil and gas with Algeria, uh, even with Mo Morocco, which is an ally, and I'll let uh, Hassan uh, comment on that, but it's not very important. Uh, in security, yes, it is very important, but economically, uh, it's the EU uh, in general uh, and, uh, and China, uh, China, uh, basically uh, many uh, in Algeria, you know, in the last decade, you know, there have been, um, in terms of contracts and uh, and investments in Algeria alone is $23 billion. So that, that, that is uh, very important, unlike what it is with Tunisia uh, or Morocco. So, so for, the, for the Algerians, at least you know, for the state to state, I think um, because the, uh, the uh, trade agreement uh, with, with the French, I mean, with, with the EU, um, the Algerians have been very uh, upset with it because they don't believe that it has brought anything uh, you know, to, to, to Algeria. So they, they will continue to diversify uh, and do business with, uh, with whoever. Uh, I think that, it's, that is the bottom line, at least as, uh, as far as Algeria is concerned. Now, unless uh, the Europeans you know, come up with some, the Europeans come up with some packages and so on. And, and the other uh, idea is that, um, the, you know, the, the, what happens the, in the relations with China, you don't have the same type of conditionality uh, that comes from, from the outside. Whether one likes it or not, that's a different story. But, you know, the, the Chinese do not impose uh, any uh, conditions. And b basically, even Morocco, uh, they appreciate the concept of non-interference uh, in domestic affairs. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, moving to uh, to Hassan. Uh, similar question, uh, of course. Uh, how how should European and uh, uh, and uh, U.S. foreign policymakers react to Chinese uh, overtures towards uh, Morocco? 
Well, I, I can't say what the Americans and the Europeans should do. It's up to them. But I'm just, you know, noticing what's, what's going on, actually. Uh, there is a, a turning point. I mean, there is before the, the pandemic and the, the after. Definitely, there was a kind of, kind of dealing with accepting the Chinese game before. The, the, the French, so to speak, were concerned about the, the interference or the penetration of the Chinese you know, economy, but they could not express it loudly. They were, uh, so to speak, very concerned. They expressed that in very closed milieu, and they wanted to adopt new approach, uh, uh, meaning that there should be kind of common ground between all North African to contain the Chinese quote unquote threat. So there was a kind of new deal, how to come up with a common block where there is Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia to, to contain. That's the new game that, you know, some French uh, 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 have expressed within certain th think tanks. Um, but definitely things have, or at least would, would change nowadays after the pandemic. When it comes to the, the states, I do think that they didn't care about, you know, how the Chinese were penetrating the Moroccan economy. Morocco was a small market for them. They, they didn't care. Uh, what counted is, is politics. And even with politics, they were completely absent, uh, completely absent. I mean, the Americans have, have withdrawn, I mean, recently from, from all of the Arab world. Uh, that's a fact. They realized that it was a mistake. Last that, that was a mistake. And nowadays, if there is a kind of motto that is very familiar, is what the Moroccan, well, the Moroccans speak, you know, the two CDDs trap. They, they are aware that there is something cooking between America and, 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 uh, and China. But there is something that is concerning America, which is the Huawei company that is considered to be as spying tool. Uh, I do think that's, that's very important from from the American perspective. Uh, and they might discourage Moroccan companies, Moroccan government to deal with Hawaii, Hawaii uh, a company. Uh, to, to end up, as, as Sarah had mentioned with regards to Tunisia and the Chinese products for uh, projects to, to provide Tunisia with TGV, uh, you know, uh, uh, high speed uh, train. As you know, there is very, you know, uh, uh, how should I say, um, successful experience of TGV between Casablanca and Tangier that had been conducted by the French. Nowadays, there is a new project between Marrakesh and Agadir, and it looks that the Chinese are well placed because they provide the same product for less and this kind of economic rationality. Nowadays, I don't think that the economic rationality would be the only uh, uh, element. I do think that nowadays, because th the framework ha had completely changed, uh, I, I don't think the Moroccan government would still stick to the Chinese because it's the same product for less, or the French because there's strategic relationship, whatever. I do think that that, that, would, be, that would be a test. If, if Morocco would pick, you know, the Chinese companies, that means that we are within the economic rationality. If the Moroccan government would pick the French, that it means that there are other elements which are strategic. And I do think that, you know, the framework had, had completely changed. Uh, I think in terms of the, the kind of great power, the, the broader geopolitical implications of some of this, um, You know, I think there's still a big question mark surrounding, um, certainly surrounding U.S. policy in the region writ large, um, and and also really the extent to which great power competition as a kind of ordering principle, or what what that's actually going to mean for U.S. strategy, U.S. policy in the region. I don't think we really know that yet. I, I'm not I'm not really sure that the current administration knows that, um, honestly. And so it, th that's a big question mark. When it comes to US and Chinese um, interests or involvement or potential competition in the Maghreb, um, I, I actually think for the most part, their interests overlap. 
Um, I don't see too many points of contention. This is not the US Russia uh, relationship, that, which is a very different dynamic. And I think, I think Washington sees in, in, in Moscow's involvement in the Maghreb something much more, perceives there to be something much more nefarious. When it comes to Chinese engagement, um, whether it's on things like energy or trade or freedom of navigation or counterterrorism, I, I think that there actually isn't a lot of, of daylight between, um, between the U.S. and China. And in some very important ways, and my, my colleague Mike Singh has written about this, I think the U.S. and China actually benefit from each other's engagement in, in the Maghreb. So for its part, um, I tend to think, but Tang can correct me, that China still thinks it probably benefits more from the security umbrella that the U.S. Uh, provides um, in the region. And so when it comes to, for example, ensuring freedom of navigation, if, if the Chinese really do want to extend their Belt and Road, that the maritime route, and have it implicate the Mediterranean, it is in their interest to see the U.S. Sixth Fleet continued to monitor and make sure that things, um, you know, remain relatively secure uh, throughout that throughout that region. So it's not obvious that, from the Chinese standpoint, an American withdrawal from the region is actually in 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 its interest. And I think on the flip side, and here I I, I think what Hassan was saying about needing to think potentially in terms of a kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think, I, think I think you're right. I think that it's very likely that in a post-COVID environment, um, the United States is not going to have the economic, um, I think it's very likely, and, and it was a trend, which I think is unfortunate, but it was a trend that predated COVID of, of a kind of declining amounts of U.S. foreign assistance in some of these in some of these countries. I think that's only likely to be exacerbated now in the post-COVID era. And so to the extent that China can maybe pick up some of that slack, so to speak, and continue investing um, in, in the economies of these countries, there too, I think it will likely only further um, the, uh, the common interests that the U.S. and and uh, that at least the U.S. has an interest as well in seeing these economies develop. Um, and so if Chinese engagement can further that goal, great. But, the, and here's the last thing I would say is that the but, um, there are areas I think of Chinese involvement which have already and, and will likely continue to raise some eyebrows in, in Washington. And um, for, exa for example, the, the matter of arms sales, okay? so. Um, in the countries that we've been looking at today, I think the, the one that the U.S. is paying most close attention to is Algeria, because the, the Chinese have been um, selling armed drones, for example, and the increase in those, uh, in the sales of those, those, those kinds of weapons, I think is, are, is going to be um, something that Washington will, will likely um, be paying close attention to um, in the coming years. Stop there. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks a lot to our audience who have sent through the, the, the questions. We've received three or four questions uh, related to each other. It's, uh, it's the question of the Chinese uh, treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, so, which is a very important issue uh, and was touched upon briefly by, by Hassan. And Hassan, you mentioned that the Islamists uh, only uh, sort of raised this issue. But I mean, I guess the question is, uh, is it just the Islamists or is this a, a society-wide issue? Uh, and will the Uyghur issue uh, affect the relationship uh, with China from, from the Maghreb side? Or because China says we will not interfere with you, you will not interfere with us type of uh, uh, approach. Yeah, yeah? You know, as far as the governments are concerned, you know, this the Algerian government signed that letter uh, that uh, said that China was was doing uh, what it was doing domestically, and they didn't see uh, any um, grand scale uh, repression and so on and so forth. Morocco did not sign it, by the way. Um, but I think I am certain that at the popular level, uh, you know, that there might be uh, some concerns about the the treatment of uh, uh, of the Igur, uh, or at least uh, what they hear. 
But I can tell you one thing, when it comes from uh, President Trump, I don't think that they would take it very seriously because of the way uh, the perception is about his own treatment of, uh, of Muslims, you know, when he was banning uh, Muslims coming uh, to the uh, uh, to the United States, and I remember, you know, in Algiers, people were, were, you know, uh, what, what is this? Uh, why are they doing this to the Muslims and so on and so forth? But I think it's, uh, uh, th I think that China has not been very good at uh, communicating on on the issue. I noticed that recently they they are showing some reports about, you know, the terrorism in in, in Xinjiang itself and separating uh, what those people were doing compared to the normal so-called uh, people in, in the region. But I think you're not, it's not gonna be just the Islamists raising the issue if it's, uh, if it's proven that uh, uh, it, it is really concentration camps and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the, um, whether people are paying that much uh, attention, even in Turkey, which where the government has raised the, uh, the issue back and forth uh, at the you know at the level of uh, of people it, it hasn't um, been a big issue there were no demonstrations against china or what have you so so i'm not sure that this would have would have a, a big impact i agree with with yahya i mean we have to admit that the uyghur you know situation is not you know as well as perceived as critical was as well known, it doesn't have the same, you know, perception like, for example, the Rohingya in, with, with, in, in Burma or even Muslims in, in Kashmir. That's the fact. I mean, it's not something that is uh, well spread, and even I don't think that it's uh, uh, well known. Uh, China is, is not well known from the Moroccan perspective. It has say, I mean, uh, and the Moroccans still look at China through the lens of the West. You know, there is no direct knowledge. And particularly, you know, most Moroccans don't master English. So most of the time they know China through, you know, the, the French uh, language. But still, still, there are some Islamists who are familiar, who are some, do sympathize with the Uyghur. I remember, for example, two years ago, there was, um, Uyghur leader that passed away, and you know there was kind of widespread uh, uh, social media event, you know. But still, it's not something that is popular. When it comes to the government, you know, though the Moroccan government, I cannot speak on behalf of it, uh, but definitely they don't, they wouldn't feel very strongly about, you know, uh, the Islamists. I mean, they are very pragmatic, and they will def definitely prefer to deal with the China, which with, with which they have very close interest than, you know, siding with, with, uh, with the Uyghur. I do think that the only ones who feel very strongly about the Uyghur in terms of nations would be Turkey because of the Turkish background. I, I might be wrong, but there is kind of very Turkish sensitivity, uh, but it's still there. I mean, it's, uh, they are the ones that are feel strong, particularly within, within uh, 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 the, the Islamist movements here in Morocco. I have to admit also that in December there was a huge coverage about the Muslim Uyghurs in, in the French media, uh, and this particularly in Le Monde, you know, uh, and that Moroccans have discovered, you know, the situation on, of the Uyghur through, you know, the, the French media. Uh, and the French media, they are not Islamists, they don't have any sympathy with regards to, to Islam. It has to do with the human rights. But I do think, I do think that's something that will gain ground in the future. I don't think that, you know, nowadays there are very few in Morocco that know about the Uyghur, but in the coming future, I do think that would, that would gain ground in the future. Great, thanks. Sara? Um, I don't think this, the only, the only uh, public display of a concern about the the Uyghurs as far as I have been able to tell anyway. There was a very small protest, um, I think in January, uh, a group of, a group representing imams of Tunisia, um, and they came out and, and, and protested against China's uh, treatment of, of that community. Um, 
Tunisia, you know, there had been this sort of exchange of letters that, um, and in the, in the initial, there was an initial condemnation, uh, a, a letter written on the part of a few dozen mostly Western countries condemning the Chinese treatment. And then there was a, a, a kind of response letter um, written kind of defending the Chinese uh, human rights record. And that second letter had been notable because of the number of majority Muslim countries that had, that had signed it. So um, uh, Saudi Arabia among them, for example. So um, Tunisia abstained from signing that second uh, letter. Um, so it didn't lend its, its name to it. And I think Morocco was, was the same. I don't know, I don't know um, about the others. But um, so I think it, it's not an issue that has gotten too much um, attention. And so again, there's sometimes the lack of visibility works, I think, in, in China's interest when it comes to the sort of public perceptions um, in Tunisia. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, Tang, I have a question specifically for you. Uh, the question says, how uh, sustainable is the non-interference policy of China given China's growing economic footprint in, in the region? I think it's a, it's a good question because obviously China is walking a tightrope uh, in the number of conflicts and rivalries in, in the region. Of course, we have uh, uh, Iran, and, uh, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. We have uh, Chinese views on, on Israel and, and Palestine. Uh, and of course, closer to our topic today, uh, the Western Sahara issue between uh, Morocco uh, and Algeria. So how, how do you see uh, China continuing this, this delicate balance uh, amongst these hot button issues uh, uh, in the region? Yeah, so uh, this uh, then deals with the understanding of uh, this non-interference policy. It doesn't mean, I, in my opinion, it doesn't mean like absolute uh, distance from all these complicated uh, international issues. And uh, yeah, it's already un uh, inevitable to get uh, sometimes touched uh, upon some of these sensitive issues. And, uh, but I would say this uh, non-interference is uh, rather an attitude. Like Hassan uh, uh, Shahia already mentioned, uh, we, the China just uh, doesn't have this uh, patronizing attitude towards uh, the other countries. Therefore, then this uh, non-interference is uh, rather to just uh, respect uh, other countries' uh, decision. And uh, uh, yeah, also yeah, in some, uh, especially it's also kind of uh, acknowledgement of uh, uh, China's own like a uh, lack of knowledge in this uh, complicated issues. But so usually China then when China meet such uh, challenges, China would uh, say just uh, you should uh, yeah increase communication. You should uh, in uh, yeah do it through negotiating among yourselves, like China did in South Sudan and the Sudan issues. And the China, uh, this uh, already can show some uh, examples because China actually has a lot of uh, economic interests in uh, Sudan and also then the South Sudan after the, uh, the separation. But uh, actually, China also uh, took active role in bring different parts to negotiation tables, but that actually doesn't violate China's non-interference policy because uh, it's uh, in the end it's uh, the uh, different parties within these countries they reach agreement. China doesn't uh, impose any rules to to them, and I think this will serve a model. And uh, uh, also, for uh, also this, this can shed a light on this uh, understand how to understand this non-interference policy. It doesn't mean uh, like a completely abstinence, but it rather means uh, uh, attitude to uh, yeah let the parties or, or to respect local culture. 
Thanks, thanks, thanks. And this perfectly leads us to, uh, to another uh, key question. Uh, uh, Libya uh, was not part of the, the focus today, uh, but there's a question on Libya, and I think it's, uh, it's interesting. Of course, some uh, European powers have, uh, have taken sides in the, in the, uh, in the Libya uh, conflict. The U.S. has, uh, has been very uh, absent, notably absent from it, has made some efforts, but has, uh, has retreated. So I wanted perhaps uh, our speakers who would like to reflect on, on the Libya issue and in particularly uh, the role of, of global powers uh, in potentially resolving the conflict or uh, inflaming it uh, uh, further. Uh, to start with Hassan or Yahya, uh, Hassan? As you have mentioned, the ones that are directly concerned within the Libyan conflict are the Europeans and mostly France and Italy. Uh, the ones that are directly uh, uh, involved and interested. Um, this was would be a threat to the security in the region. I do think that had, had been expressed uh, due to the Berlin c conference, uh, surprisingly, both, I mean, all the North African countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, almost have the same uh, uh, position, uh, siding with the, the, the government, the, the uh, legitimate government, what is called the legitimate government of, of, of Siraj. I do think that there is something that had changed yesterday in Cairo. For the first time, there is kind of Arabic platform rejecting what is called foreigner uh, elements, uh, uh, meaning, meaning Turkey. I, I do think that there is something that had been adopted uh, yesterday, and I think that Morocco had changed its, its position uh, from that, that perspective. At certain time, Morocco was defending, you know, what was called, you know, the Sahirat platform, which is the legitimate government, Siraj, I do think that something that had changed. So, so we're not going to, to, infer, to, to speak about Libya, but what I can say is that China is a way of, of all this, of this problem, so mess, as, as Tong had said. Tunisia has always been neutral when it comes to the internal conflicts between nations. I do think that the ones who are interested, you know, as I've said, France, Italy, uh, and Russia, nowadays America is, is, uh, is trying to, to, to play it. It had been completely distant, but nowadays it, it had been play, uh, player within, you know, in, in the quad mayor of, of Libya. But I don't think that the Chinese, neither now nor in the future, would, they would interfere in the, in the Libyan uh, uh, conflict, in my point of view. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Two minutes, so we can go. Uh, all right. As far as China is concerned, China has lost a lot uh, in 2011. Uh, its neutrality did not pay off because he, they did not uh, support the National uh, Transition uh, Council for a while until the end. Uh, they had to evacuate more than 36,000 of their workers, and they lost about $20 billion. But uh, as far as the Libyan question is concerned now, I am not, I'm not sure uh, I agree with Hassan that things have changed. I'm not, you know, because uh, the, the, the Arab League itself, uh, within it, the most powerful are the ones who are responsible for the chaos in Libya. If you take, you know, the Emiratis and the Saudis, they have been uh, pumping money, uh, you know, using uh, Haftar uh, in Libya. They, you know, which, which was a real hurdle to any kind of mediation. You have the neighbors, Algeria and, and Tunisia, and Algeria in particular, which is about a thousand kilometers with, with Libya, has proposed, you know, some sort of uh, mediation, uh, but every time it was overturned by the, the players on, on the ground. So now Egypt is, is calling on this sort of anti-Ottoman uh, thing, you know, to rally all the Arabs, you know, against Turkey. But had it not been for Turkey, uh, I think Tripoli would have been taken over by, uh, by Haftar with whatever consequences. I'm not sure that, that they're finding, you know, mass graves, uh, you know, in Tarhuna and so on. So uh, I don't think it's, it, it's resolved yet unless the, the big players are not France and Italy. I think the big players are Turkey and Russia. And if these two 
come to an agreement, there might be some sort of settlement because the the, the Russians, uh, you know, can 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 control, uh, you know, militarily at least, you know, they can control some of the situation. Now it depends on whether the United States is going to side with Turkey, uh, you know, uh, a NATO member. Or, or, or find some, some other solution. For the United States, the only unacceptable thing, uh, because it hasn't been really involved in Libya except for anti-terrorism, is not to have a, a, a Russian base uh, in Libya. Very good. Sarah, would you like to have a minute to reflect on, uh, on, on Libya before we, we close off? I, I think most of what was said on, on Libya, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's a terrible mess, um, and I, I think what has been maybe interesting from an analytical point of view is that it, it is very hard to find, I mean, whether you come down uh, against the Turks or against the, the Emiratis on this, it's, it's almost impossible to, um, the, I think the biases are, are so deep here, even in, not, not here physically in this group, but just in general when it comes to uh, analyzing Libya. Nobody looks good in this situation. I mean, full stop. None of the people, none of the actors, none of the outside actors who were involved, and some of the internal actors who have been involved, do. Ha everybody has their, their share of the blame. But it's very hard to find uh, kind of outside perspectives um, that, that can look as, as close as we would like to, to look objectively um, at, at, this, at, at the situation. And in the meantime, I don't, I don't, I'm not particularly optimistic about um, Libya, at least in the short term. I think there are amazing Libyans um, who, if they can get their country back, um, will actually could, could turn it into something, you know, really promising and meaningful. But I just don't see that happening uh, anytime soon, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, apologize to some of our participants. There's been lots of questions. I tried to combine them uh, together, but perhaps this could be a, a, a topic for a future uh, webinar. Uh, we've, we're right bang on, on time, uh, so I will end there. But first, I'd really like to thank our uh, uh, panelists for joining us. Uh, this has been a very, very enriching uh, discussion. Uh, this video will actually be translated uh, and posted on the Hollings website, uh, so please uh, check it uh, there, and we look forward to hosting you again. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.